Unitarian Council. And uh, I welcome you all. Samaya Oakley and Shauna Lingood, the ministers from South Fraser and Victoria congregations in BC have coordinated the service with participation from all over the country. Please sit back and take it in. For far too long, being a Unitarian or Unitarian Universalist has meant a very narrow way of being. Today, we gather to challenge, to celebrate, and to envision the future. For far too long, we have taken workshops and talked of our aspirations with great earnestness and hope, but little resolve. For far too long, we spoke about multiculturalism as the ethical and right thing to do with no sense of possibility or joy. So come, let us gather together today across Canada on the Sharing Our Faith Sunday to envision the future that we might joyfully inhabit together when we all feel welcome and whole, challenged and loved yeah. in our congregations and communities. Come, let us gather together knowing that our interdependence calls us to love and justice. Come, let us join together in worship. I'm Camille Buskella, and I'm in Sherbrooke, Quebec. I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather <clears throat> is the traditional and unceded territory of the Abenaki people and the Wabanaki Confederacy. I'm the Reverend Ann Barker. I use she, her pronouns, and I am located in Edmonton. I would like to acknowledge the Treaty 6 peoples, including the Blackfoot, Cree, Dene, Nakota Sioux and Soto, and later the Métis. And I am Reverend Danielle Weber. I am located in Kelowna. Mm -hmm. I use she, her pronouns. And I acknowledge that I am on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan people. Each tribe has special and beautiful traditions that have borne witness to thousands of years of history, culture, and spirituality, which provides a rich and fertile context as we learn and grow together in spiritual <laughs> community. As Unitarian Universalists, our first principle is the inherent worth and dignity of every person, which I believe is to be a keystone in reconciliation. I acknowledge my role as a treaty person and feel called to explore what that means and how to be a responsible and respectful ally. Spirit of life. Stirrings of compassion blow in the wind, rise in the sea, move in the hand, giving life the shape of justice.
We are here to be lifted in love. Look at the birds they tell us. We are here to be lifted in love. Look at the trees they tell us. We're here to be lifted in love. To listen to love as a flower raises its face to the sun. We are all one here to be lifted in grace and love. We are here to be lifted in love. Look at the sky. This is the story of Cartwheel and her two blankets, told as she would have told it. Auntie used to call me Cartwheel, then came the war. Auntie didn't call me Cartwheel anymore. We came to this country to be safe. Everything was strange. The people were strange, the animals were strange, and the plants were strange. The food was strange. Even the wind felt strange. Nobody spoke as I did. When I went out, it was like standing under a waterfall of strange sounds. The waterfall was cold. It made me feel alone. I felt like I wasn't me anymore. When I was at home, I wrapped myself in a blanket of my own words and sounds. I called it my old blanket. My old blanket was warm. It was soft. It covered me all over. It made me feel safe. Sometimes I didn't want to go out. I wanted to stay under my old blanket forever. 
One day, a girl in the park smiled at me. Then she waved. I wanted to smile back, but I was scared. I kept walking with Auntie. When I looked up again, she, was, she waved again. The next time we went to the park, I looked for the girl. She wasn't there. We went back three more times before I saw her again. She waved and she smiled and I felt warm inside. The girl came up to us and said something. Her words were strange. It was like being back under the cold waterfall. But the girl kept smiling. She took me to the swings. I got on and she pushed me higher and higher. I wanted to laugh. I wanted to tell her how glad I was that we were friends. But I didn't know how. When I went home, I hid under my old blanket and wondered if I would always feel sad. I wondered if I would ever feel like me again. The next time I saw the girl, she brought some words for me. She made me say them over and over. Over and over. Every time I met the girl, she brought more words. Some of the words were hard, some of them were easy. Sometimes I sounded funny and we laughed. Sometimes I felt silly and I wanted to cry. At night, when I lay in bed under my old blanket, I whispered the new words again and again. Soon, they didn't sound so cold and sharp anymore. They started to sound warm and soft. I was weaving a new blanket. At first, my new blanket was thin and small, but every time I added new words to it, the blanket grew and grew, and I forgot about the cold and lonely waterfall. My new blanket grew just as warm and soft and comfortable as my old blanket. And no matter which blanket I use, I will always be me. We share with you now the reading of Sean Parker Dennison, our colleague. This reading is entitled, To Invoke Love. To invoke love is to ask for a hug from a thunderstorm. Spill tea in the lap of the infinite trickster. To make the biggest, most embarrassing mistake of your life in front of everyone who matters. To invoke love is to never know if it will come softly with the nuzzle of a beloved dog or pounce right on your chest with the strength of a lioness protecting her cub, her pride, her homeland. To invoke love is to take the risk of inviting chaos to visit the spaces you spent so much time making tidy and watch as the breath of life scatters everything you have only just folded and put away. To invoke love is to allow for the possibility that your words and actions might become so empowered you can no longer believe in apathy or the self-righteous idea that nothing can change. To invoke love is to give up self-depreciation, false humility, pride, to consider yourself worthy to be made whole, willing to encounter love that will never let us let each other go. To invoke love is to guard against assumptions, to take care with our words, and to practice forgiveness, 
not as ethereal ideal, but right here in the messy mist of our imperfect lives. To invoke love is to approach each day and every person with wonder, anticipating love's arrival. Is this the moment? Is this love's grand entrance? Is this person the embodiment of love? Am I the one? To invoke love is to play the fool the one more concerned with loving than with appearance or reputation, the one ready and willing to be vulnerable, abandoning anything that gets in love's way. To invoke love is to be ready to become love here, now, in everything we do. Are you ready? Humbly we walk here, humbly we sing here, humbly we bless this ground. Humbly we walk. serve our congregation in Winnipeg, Manitoba. The reading today is from After the Good News by the Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd. On the 50th anniversary of the March on Selma, at which many progressive Protestants heeded the call to march with Martin Luther King, Mark Morrison Reed spoke at a gathered company of faithful progressives who were preparing to board buses to Selma and walk in the actual footsteps of the civil rights leaders who went before them. Speaking from the depths of his scholarly research and from his experience as an African American minister in a white dominated tradition, he lifted up the significant ways that Unitarian Universalist involvement in Selma truly changed the people who were there. He said that what it changed most of all was our progressive movement's expectations of ourselves. 
to many black leaders in the faith. The Unitarian Universalist presence in Selma telegraphed that the denomination was finally ready to meet history and its persistent struggle without shrinking away into white middle-class comforts. It was a signal that perhaps their always hopeful tradition was finally willing to stay in the troubled waters, in abiding relationship to those who were drowning. Black leaders thought it was an opportunity to take the next step in the evolution of their own faith and vision for the faith tradition they loved. Because of this, Mark Morrison Reed said that the aftermath of Selma and the height of the civil rights movement marked an important turning point in the approach of African American leaders within the Unitarian Universalist tradition. It was the moment, he said, when black leadership shifted from integration to self-determination. Finally, black leaders thought they could stop going along to get along with the white majority in their progressive congregations and guide the course of the future on terms they could actually set for themselves. In less than four years, that shift towards self-determination proved to be something our optimistic and forward-reaching denomination was not fully prepared to accept. In 1968, after initially supporting denominational funding for black organized efforts within Unitarian Universalism to fight their own political repression and champion their own cultural expression, associated leadership encountered sharp internal criticism in a variety of forms. In 1969, singed by the claim that Black caucusing was tantamount to both separatism and some form of reverse discrimination, the primarily white leadership of the denomination voted to sharply curtail that funding for Black caucus groups, shifting away from self-determination and back into the conservative hope for integration into the larger white dominated culture of the liberal church. The old story of upward historical progress laid over a narrative of liberal white respectability reasserted itself all over again. The Unitarian Universalist Association wasn't ready for Black self-determination. If Black self-determination meant it actually had to grapple with the legacy of its own racial history. The following people of color avatar the first of a few is not based on the narrative of one interviewer, one interviewee, it is an amalgam of several interviewees narratives that have been interpreted thematically. POC avatar number one, disillusioned yet determined. Decades ago, I was drawn to Unitarian Universalism because I understood that it was a faith tradition that would honor and affirm my pursuit of truth and meaning. Unitarian Universalism, more specifically my church, became my spiritual home. But over the years, there have been small comments and behaviors, some not so small, that have left me feeling that I don't belong. And when I can't feel centered and grounded in my church community, I bent, begin to question myself and question why I'm here. I'm accustomed to dealing with racism in other settings, but at my church, that shouldn't be. More often than I once admitted, 
I've encountered racism in my church, and I've heard similar stories from other POC. An indigenous friend told me that a First Nations poet who'd been invited to give a reading at the church was late for the reading. A couple congregants remarked on how those people work on their own time and according to a different schedule than ours. Unaware that even though he, he didn't look indigenous, my friend is indigenous and felt othered by this comment. Once after a workshop I facilitated, a congregant with a look of surprise on her face remarked at how articulate I was. She didn't have to finish that sentence. I knew she meant for a black person. When anti-racism allies in my church wanted to do white supremacy teach-ins, they asked me to help write a proposal to the board, thinking my presence would push it through. But the situation ended up with a two-fisted punch. The board didn't approve the teach-ins and I was left feeling used. The lack of resolve and action is why POC friends of mine have left the Unitarian Church and why I have considered doing the same. They've lost patience with nice Unitarians who say they stand against racism but don't demonstrate it. These nice folks merely tolerate racism. When they've witnessed it, they've done little about it. It's frustrating to see the Canadian UU world waking up now why hadn't folks listened to me and other POC before? Ironically, just as the Canadian UU world is awakening to the realities of racism, there are times when I'm too tired or feel too traumatized to do the work. Times when I just don't have the energy to help white people do their work and to facilitate their learning. I won't be their native informant anymore. I won't be the designated teacher. What I will do is remind myself and others that I belong here, but on terms that I negotiate myself. This is my spiritual home. Loosen, loosen, baby. You don't have to carry the weight of the world in your muscles and bones. Let go, let go, let go. Loosen, loosen, baby. You don't have to carry the weight of the world in your muscles and bones. Let go, let go, let go. Holy breath. And holy name, will you ease, will you ease this pain? Holy breath and holy name, will you ease, will you ease this pain? Loosen, loosen, baby. Let go, let go. The weight of the world in your muscles and bones. Let go, let go, let go. 
muscles and bones. Let go, let go, let go. The weight of the world in your muscles and bones. Let go, let go, let go. My dear ones, there is so much that weighs in our muscles and bones and our hearts and our minds as we become one body of Canadian Unitarian Universalists in this service. We whose journeys are always beginning, we whose mission always awaits us, we whose visions are bent on loving, we gather together to name, to witness, and to acknowledge all that is on our hearts. In this space, we become one community drawn together out of common need. We are aware of the hope that pulses on through untold sufferings. We hold a tenderness for one another that can only be known from knowing human blessings and human failures. When we, hold, when we hold all of this in our hearts, we enter holy ground, a place where our thirsting and hunger for meaning draw us to the source of all devotion and grace. In the next few minutes, you will have an opportunity to share what is most tender on your hearts. This is the time where what is resting on your heart is shared so that it can be witnessed and held by this community. For this ritual of lament, you will have that opportunity to share what is on your heart. And we have several readers that will read out a statement that touch on what many of us are holding in our hearts. If you resonate with the statement that is read and have something resting on your heart to share, you will be able to do so after that statement is read. At that time, please type into the chat what is on your heart. After one minute, the reader will light a candle to honor all that has been shared. We will not be reading out what appears in the chat. So we invite you to allow the words to scroll by, holding love in your heart and bearing witness as you do so. We live in many shadows. We are sometimes afraid. Please share the fear that you are holding in your heart. Please write in the chat. In the shadows, we light a candle of hope. We all have sorrows. We have known pain. Each of us carries our special regrets. Please take a moment now to share the pain and special regrets that you hold in your heart.
in our pain, we light a candle of forgiveness. We are sometimes lonely and the world seems cold and hard. For those of you who are experiencing loneliness, please share that now in the chat. our loneliness, we light a candle of warmth. We have our joys, our times of happiness. Each of, each of us receives gifts. What are the gifts that you acknowledge in your life right now? Please share them in the chat. In our gratitude, we light a candle of thanks. We have known awe and wonder, mystery, glimmerings of perfection in an imperfect world. Where does awe and wonder and mystery appear in your life? Please share a note in the chat. In our wonder, we light a candle of praise. We bring together many uncertainties many sorrows, many joys, and much wonder. We bring together many candles and many lights. May our separate lights become one flame that together we may be nourished by its glow. In our oneness, 
let this radiance of many call us to cast upon all the world the light of freedom, justice, and peace. morning and afternoon. My name is Reverend Shauna Lingood. I am one of the co-ministers of the First Unitarian Church of Victoria. And as Julia Bullock just sang to you, soon you too shall find peace. At my ordination, my mentor said something that everyone present has never forgotten in his charge to me. He said, anything worth doing in life is worth doing badly. Simple, unvarnished truth. He went on to say that we live in a culture that is focused on success. We won't even try or attempt things, he said, that we don't think we are assured of succeeding in before we even begin. Yet, if we are to break out of our Unitarian Universalist rut, and the personal ruts as well that we find ourselves in for that matter, we are going to have to be willing to attempt things at which we will most definitely fail. Meaningful change requires failure along the way. Unitarian Universalist history, as, we, as you heard in the reading from our colleague Nancy McDonald Ladd, is riddled with failure. Even the best histories, and don't we Unitarian Universalists like to think of our history as one of the better ones, are filled with both shining achievements and heartbreaking cautionary tales. Unitarian Universalist history is filled with prophetic people whose lives both beckon by example and warns us of missteps and short-sightedness. We can see as we look back stories of amazing people who did so much good in the world, lives of integrity and meaning and we can see institutional mistakes, harm done, and careers ruined. We can see the places where our ancestors made choices that have kept Unitarian Universalism largely white, well-educated, 
middle class and reluctant to change. So how do each of us fit into this larger story? Who are you in our spiritual community? Which you shows up here? And how is that part of you held and seen, encouraged, pushed, or coddled? I am a lifelong Unitarian Universalist. I came to this faith when my single mother sought community and connection for herself and her daughter. This faith tradition has given me so much. I have been connected to people who mean the world to me through it. So many of the people I hold dear I met through this faith. I have shared so many moments of beauty and meaning, more than I can count. Times that, I have, that have moved me to tears and brought a smile to my face. It has given me my life's work and a sense of purpose. It has also had me bear witness to many cringe-worthy moments and made me work harder than I should have had to, to find my voice and claim my truth. All of which leads me to my main point in my message to you this morning. Our us, our community needs to expand and be more flexible and open than it currently is if it is not only to survive in the 21st century, but live up to the ideals it professes. Let me elaborate. The congregation that I grew up in was a lovely place, an attractive building on a nice parcel of land and full of wonderful people. It was also very homogenous. The music was almost always classical, the sermon like a high quality academic lecture, the members mostly of the same class and race with a few exceptions. It was lovely and it was too comfortable, too conforming. There was little room for emotion or messiness, or anything that could have been perceived as challenging what was, more than this is what we do here, it felt very much like this is how we are, which it occurred to me later quite easily leads to this is who we are. How will we have to change and expand in order to be more deeply inclusive? How can we welcome people to be more than stereotypes and move beyond the spaces that we have created for them to neatly fit into our assumptions? How much are we willing to make mistakes and make apologies and commit to being changed? being better. I spent seven years as the associate minister of the amazing congregation, All Souls Church Unitarian in Washington, DC. I will forever be grateful for my time there and yet there were ways in which it was a real struggle for me the first few years I was there. All Souls is much more diverse than most Unitarian Universalist congregations, and I felt pressure and expectations from all sides of the community in ways that didn't leave space for me to be me. The folks of color in the congregation wanted me to represent them in a very particular way. They had a vision of what my ministry should look like, and they didn't want me to make mistakes 
as they were sure that that would end up reflect, reflecting poorly on them. The white folks in the congregation, on the other hand, wanted me to make the congregation more diverse by my mere presence. I was to be a savior of sorts for them, leading them to the promised land of the beloved community that they longed to be, but wanted someone else to do the work to become. Neither group wanted me to be me to say what I needed to say and share what I saw. It took the first three years of my ministry before I was established enough to be truly seen on my own merits. And as a whole minister who had particular gifts and weaknesses that were not the stuff of projection, or expectation. And isn't that what we want for everyone in our congregations and communities? The chance to be fully themselves and to grow and change alongside us, bringing us right along with them through the ups and downs of being human. Unitarian Universalism has changed a great deal since I was a kid. And yet, it hasn't changed enough. I still see so many echoes and outlines and impacts of who we have been on who we still are. We still need to embrace our history and our theology, and we need to modernize it to fit into a 21st century world that is global and multicultural. If we don't, we will find ourselves a limited faith, only able to meet the needs of a homogenous and aging slice of the whole of humanity. Let's not go extinct because we cling too strongly to only having our individual needs met, to a social club mentality that maintains a very limited club at that. Let's not go extinct because we refuse to rise to the occasion. And let's not go extinct by refusing to live into our principles. For how can you honor the inherent worth and dignity of all people while only allowing some in your doors? How can you say you feel the truth of your interdependence while pushing for your congregation to only do what feeds you musically or spiritually? The prophetic people of our past and present are calling us to change, calling us to be open-hearted and willing us to try new things. Will we listen? Or will we repeat the mistakes of the past? It is my prayer that we will heed the call. Blessed be. Walking, walking with you, walking with you is my prayer. Praying, praying with you, praying with you is my prayer. I originally presented these thoughts at our Soul Matters group. Last summer, the media reported an increase in racial injustice and the Black Lives Matter movement grew more vocal. In August, at South Fraser, all in August, South Fraser congregants were asked to come out and hold a placard between 1 and 2 p.m. on a busy street 
in front of where we hold our regular Sunday gatherings in support of Black Lives Matter. We were asked to make our own placard. I was not comfortable with protesting on a busy street, nor was I totally comfortable holding a placard with the wording Black Lives Matter. While identifying with Black Lives Matter, I did not feel it spoke to many of the racial issues in our community. I was more comfortable with the word racism, which is the basis of injustice around the Black Lives Matters and speaks more closely to issues in our community and even the rest of Canada. I do not see myself as someone who you would expect to see out protesting on a busy street. Telling people what I do was not hard, but telling them uh, and using the word protest in the same sentence was not easy. When I look at it as participating in social action, I feel more comfortable standing on the street with my placard. I have spent many days working at trade shows in a booth. I see a lot of similarity between connecting with people when working at booth and my social activism on the street. With time, I found myself not just standing there and waving my hand, but making eye contact with passing motorists and waving to them. I also found that supporters appreciate a response to their hand waving or horn honking. What keeps me coming out on Saturday? I feel, I really feel we have racial issues everywhere. I feel with our activism, we are effective in reminding people about injustice. As you drive around our community, you, you see no signs anywhere making mention of racism. We know where horn honkers and high hand wavers stand on this issue. When you wave to somebody, when you give them eye contact and you see a slight smile, you know you have connected. After 20 years as a UU member of our congregation, I feel I am out supporting our values ever so slightly, helping people, people realize what we need to do to make for a better community and country. I have had many UU experiences of talking about what is wrong. Most of the discussions are over a cup of coffee. Standing on the street, holding my placard, I feel I am a UU member actively doing something positive in our community. In closing, I am reminded of the power of feet on the ground. Sorry. Crying, crying with you, crying with you is my prayer. Laughing, laughing with you, laughing with you is my prayer. Each Saturday from one to two in the afternoon, I stand outside on the road and approximately 140 cars pass by me every five minutes. Every single person in those cars have basically three decisions to make. When they see signs that say it's time to end racism or Black Lives Matters, they can either affirm the statements, they can choose to ignore it, or they can choose to let me know they don't agree with me. And just last week, as I was standing there, I remembered my time with the late Reverend William Jones, a Unitarian Universalist minister, activist, existential philosopher and professor who dedicated his career to the analysis and methods of oppression, religious humanism, and liberal liberation theology. And I had the privilege of meeting him near the end of his life. And I can remember Bill very clearly raising his hands like this. 
and with his index finger trace along the U that is created between the thumb and the forefinger. And he would tell me that each time we encountered a, a situation, we have the same choice as the people in the cars driving by. I could continue to perpetuate a system of oppression and maintain it through my actions. I could also choose to do something about it. And you see the space in here in the middle, this space where we don't take any action. Well, that's also a way to perpetuate and continue our biases. A non action is in, in essence, a decision. And no longer can we deny that we have broken systems that privilege one group over another. No longer can we say that racism is a US issue or an issue in another area of the country, an issue anywhere but where we live. When we saw the video of how Joyce Ichaquan, a 37-year-old woman, indigenous woman, who lay dying, how she was treated by her nurses in Quebec in October last year, we realize that the issue is closer to home than we think. A 2019 survey indicates nearly half of Canadians believe discrimination against Black people is no longer a problem, even as 83% of Black people in Canada say they are unfairly treated at least some of the time. The issue is closer to home than we realize. And then to hear Beverly and Shauna speak aloud the words that so many Black, Indigenous people of color say and feel about their experience in our Canadian congregation brings it home in a new and stark way. To hear Quote, they've lost patience with nice Unitarians who say they stand against racism, but don't demonstrate that. These nice folks tolerate racism because even when they witness it, they don't do anything about it. The issue is in our congregations. The old story of upward historical progress laid over a narrative of liberal white respectability reasserted itself all over again. Unitarian Universalism is a transformational faith, a faith that calls to us to be willing to be open to change. Each time we kindle our chalice, we are reminded of that risk, of that call to this living tradition. And if it's one thing I know about change and transformation is that we have failed, we are failing, and that we will continue to fail. And here's the thing, my dear ones. This living tradition of ours calls to us to pick ourselves up and try again and again and again. We do so because our interdependence calls us to love injustice. We are called to act in ways that disrupt these patterns that cause harm. Since 2015, our congregations have sponsored both individuals and families from over a dozen countries. 
we have opened our hearts to them, providing assistance in helping these newly arrived people to establish themselves and integrate into Canadian society. And we also engaged in work and are engaging in the work of reconciliation that came about as a result of our expression of reconciliation to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2014. Trust me when I say that each of these shifts in the work came through trial and error and a willingness to be open to transformation. The Unitarian Universalist Association Commission on Institutional Changes report entitled Widening the Circle of Concern is an invitation for us all to continue the work of being open and willing to be lifted up to the light of change. We know how to do this. We can do this. Sharon Jinkerson Brass says that the work of reconciliation is, is exciting. It's like being born. And that's probably one of the biggest transformation of all of life. And this work calls to us to see the world with fresh new eyes, to look out into the world holding love in our heart. May we be so bold. May we be so courageous. And may we be so loving. I am open. I am willing for to be whole. Seems so strange and dishonest. And those who go before us, so lift me up to the light of change. There is hurting in my family, and there is sorrow in my time. All across the nation And there's a wailing The whole world round I am open And I am willing To be hopeless It seems so strange It is to go before us, so lift me up to the light of change. Be hopeless. 
Beloveds, today is Sharing Our Faith Sunday. The Sharing Our Faith Program Fund is a program of the Canadian Unitarian Council supporting projects that enhance ministry, growth, and outreach for congregations and for the Unitarian Universalist movement in Canada. It's designed to encourage greater associational awareness in our congregations and foster the relationships and the sense of community and connection between our member congregations and all of our communities. Each year, this fund is renewed by money collected by congregations at specially dedicated services and from the foundation fund administered by the First Unitarian Congregation of Toronto. These donations are typically sent to the CUC to be distributed as grants to congregations applying for projects that they might not otherwise afford. Each year, volunteers from the UU Ministers Association create a Sharing Our Faith packet and send it out filled with readings and sermons for you to choose from all the elements of a service so you can create the service that best suits your location. Since our program's inception in 2001, this is the first time we've held a Sharing Our Faith Sunday as one national congregation. In this year, of firsts. The uniqueness of gathering on Zoom means that we can be together and we can actually see one another, see one another's faces, the faces of the people who will benefit directly from these grants. Since 2001, through the generosity of our congregations and members, the Sharing Our Faith program has awarded over $200,000 to congregations. Past initiatives include support for part-time professional ministry, communication, publicity, and increasing visibility, whether through signage or social media or web presence, things like religious education, youth, and music programs. Not long ago, my congregation, Westwood Unitarian in Edmonton, received a grant to help us purchase hardware to help nudge us towards the digital age. We had no idea when we took that step, how much that would help us when all of a sudden everything was digital. Today's collection will go to the Canadian Unitarian Council Sharing Our Faith Fund. Now, in a moment, you'll see screens that tell you multiple ways you can contribute, whether by text or going to the CUC website or calling the CUC office. I'll share those with you aloud as well if you can't see the screen. But before I share those methods, I want to be really clear about two things. We know that this year has been hard and that not everyone is in a position to contribute. And if this is your circumstance, you, we are so grateful that you are here with us today and your presence at this national service is enough. And if you are in a position to contribute, I'd like a moment to speak directly to you. We wanted to celebrate the sharing our faith and our national commitments to one another in this complicated, challenging year together. We wanted to be together. Your Canadian Ministers Association offered to present this national service rather than sending out a packet as a way to bring us together to nourish our interdependence. It felt like a beautiful way to honor the spirit of sharing our faith. And the blessing of a national service is we get to hear from multiple people and many perspectives in a way we don't at home. And there is an inherent risk in doing it this way. When we could, when we could be in our buildings, sitting in our congregations on Sunday morning, when that plate is passed for a special collection, 
I know when I'm able, no matter what it is, I drop in a $20 bill. And when it's a great cause and I can, I might put in a $100 check. You remember checks, right? Or larger. And when that plate passes, we have a visceral connection to one another. We're handing something hand to hand, person to person, seeing each other participate and doing something together. We get that sense of satisfaction that we're supporting the very program that has so generously supported us in times when we were stretching to reach a new goal and that we're part of doing something real together. In Zoom world, each of us sitting in our homes or our workplaces or our vehicles or out in a park somewhere, if it's not minus 39 where you are, we don't get that same visceral experience. We are all one step further removed from that immediate practice of making a contribution. So I want to ask you to stretch with me, to reach beyond the screen and make a contribution this morning. I know it can feel awkward and it takes extra steps rather than just dropping something in a plate. For some of our congregations, this has not been a very lucrative practice as a way to collect um, income. And the danger this morning is that as a national congregation in our separate locations, that the offering will not add up to what we typically bring in when it's not the same as when 47 congregations across the country take a special collection and send it in. So I'm asking you this morning to do whatever you can you know your circumstances best. To give in the spirit of growth, to give in the spirit of reach, to give in the spirit of hope that we can live into our lessons of the past and emerge into a thriving future together. To help your neighbors grow, to help all of us grow. For 20 years, this program has helped us to help each other, to keep the flame of Unitarian Universalism ablaze and spreading in Canada. And this year, we need your help as much as we ever could. So here are your methods. You can text the word donate to 1-716-293-2525. You'll click on the link that you receive and it'll take you to a special collections form. Um, Vita's posting that the written instructions for giving will be posted. Thank you for your generosity. Easier yet, you can go directly to the website, cuc.ca, five letters and a dot, cuc.ca. Click the donate button, it's front and center and choose sharing our faith from the list. And while you're there, check out the other great opportunities for generosity. And if you'd rather use your credit card information by phone, you can call the CUC office, leave a message with your name and number and the best time to reach you, and someone will get back to you. That number is 1-888-568-5723. The CUC will gladly receive your checks as well, or e-transfers to info at cuc.ca. Just be sure to send your contact information so that you can get your tax receipts. Mark your contributions, sharing our faith. And one last thing for you congregational leaders, it would be lovely and generous if your congregation was able to dedicate the offering from one of your February services to the Sharing Our Faith Fund as well. You can collect that offering and send a check or an e-transfer to the CUC office, mark Sharing Our Faith, or let folks know how they can contribute directly. Our generous support today and throughout the month of February is an expression of our gratitude and of our hope that together we can help serve the needs of our congregations, our communities, our country, and our world. We all love that part at the annual meeting, and it's really easy to get to this year. If you got here, you can get to the annual meeting. We all love that part in the annual meeting when the grant recipients are announced, especially when it's us and we can share in one another's growth initiatives and good fortune. What happens here today is what will fuel that celebration. Thank you for your annual support 
of our communities of faith. Blessed be. I bring you now this benediction adapted from the Commission on Institutional Change of the UUA. As we leave our virtual worship space, we recommit ourselves to the central work of our faith. We commit to create conditions in which all who are attracted to the promise of our faith can thrive. We aspire to create faithful engagements, joyous engagements with difference and change that fulfills our spiritual commitments to one another. We leave this worship space committed to amplifying the voices of those who have been most directly hurt by our systems of oppression. We endeavor to live into a faith where the full participation of those who have been most marginalized among us is at the very heart of who we are. We will do what we must to create a responsive, vibrant, Unitarian Universalism in Canada, a faith marked by full equity and participation that plays a vital role in transforming lives and communities. May it be so. We are building a new way. We are 
We extinguish the flame of our chalice, but not the spark of possibility and the courage to make mistakes. We take with us the flame of just and inclusive communities. We will never be perfect. We will never be done. And that is as it should be. Take the light and the love and the hope you have felt in this time to make mistakes that move us forward. Blessed be and amen. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. The river is flowing flowing and growing the river is flowing down to the sea mother carry me your child i will always be mother carry me down to the sea la rivière roule Roule et coule, la rivière roule vers l'océan. Rivière, porte-moi, ma mère, tu resteras. Rivière, porte-moi vers l'océan. Mm -hmm. 